Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. All righty, are we ready? Even if you think you are, can you be? I now call to order the third general session of the 57th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Buenos dias. I'm here as your secretary of the association with a few announcements for you. Um, so today is like, you know, the second full day of General Assembly, two and a half days. If you've been here since Wednesday, we're starting to kind of feel like we're losing some of maybe our, our courtesies to each other, right? We're starting to really feel like we're at home and moving the furniture and doing things like that. Um, but we need to remember that we're in community. So these are a couple of uh, announcements related to that. Uh, the white accessibility chairs in the General Sesh Hall are covered for a reason. Please do not remove those covers in order to sit there. Again, we're not moving around the furniture at home, right? We're keeping an eye on how we want to welcome people into this space and have them be here in ways that they need to be here. Second to that, because if we do start moving the furniture, just like at home, somebody's gonna come and tell you, hey, please don't move the furniture. Um, we have folks with vests on that are ushers and tellers. And it would be appreciated if when they tell you something or ask you to do something, that you give them the grace to kind of follow their directions. I promise you, they are saying it for a reason, okay? If there's something that you're being asked to do that you just are like, whoa, Remember, we have chaplains, we have right relationship team, we've got board members with hats, we've got all sorts of folks that you can ask to talk to. But, you know, just try and follow those directions first. Um, and the third announcement, I, I'm really thrilled. Uh, so the Youth uh, Caucus would love you to know that all are called, elders and youth, all. This year, the youth community worship asks all of us of every age to be part of their worship. And we're gonna do this by writing your call down on a quilting square. If you'd like to do this, please go to room 2505 and find a quilting corner. That's 2505 to receive. And let's all be part of the Youth Caucus worship. Ah, oh, good morning, friends. Oh, my name is Sarah Dan Jones. I serve as one of your board of trustee members, and I'm so pleased to be here with you this morning. So I, th thank you, yeah, I'll take it. So I'm thinking, friends, that um, some of you know or don't know that I wrote this hymn, Meditation on Breathing, and I wanna sing it because it's mine and I have pulpit privilege at this moment in time. <laughs> And I can think of no better time or place to sing it than right now, right? So I'm going to invite you to rise and body your spirit. And you may sing whatever part resonates with you. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. 
when I breathe out, when I breathe out, I'll breathe out. Good, you sing to me. When I breathe in. You're beautiful. Let's all drone together. Let's all breathe and breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Let's not forget that. I invite you to have a seat. No, no, no. Stay there. I don't invite you to have a seat. <laughs> So I sing where I come from. We come from very similar places. We do? We do. And we sing a lot. And so there's some songs sometimes when I go through things that I need to sing. And so I will sing a line and you sing after me, all righty? Call and response. We are the children of the ones who did not die. We are the children of the ones who did not die. We are the children of the people who could fly. We are the children of the people who could fly. We are the children of the ones who persevered. We are the children of the ones who persevered. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. One more time. We are the children of the ones who did not die. We are the children of the ones who did not die. We are the children of the people who could fly. We are the children of the people who could fly. We are the children of the ones who persevered. We are the children of the ones who persevered. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. Now feel it in your whole body. Fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. One more time. We are fearless, we are strong, and we're ready to carry on. Thank you. Carry on. Beautiful. Can we hear from the right, can we hear from the right relationship team? My friends, will you give it up, please? Good morning. I'm a Hannah Roberts Villeneuve. And I'm Yadani Hailu, and we are your Right Relationship Team co chairs. So sometimes uh, during this time, the team offers reports about particular incidents that we have resolved or need your help resolving. But this morning, I want to offer a report that is somewhere between an observation and an admonition. Last night, we heard the choir at the service of the living tradition sing the song from the Poor People's Campaign, Somebody's Been Hurting My Brother. And it's my experience that Unitarian Universalists are pretty good at showing up to that call when somebody tells us that somebody else is hurting. But we struggle to show up in the tender, tender place that is revealed when one of our siblings says to us, somebody has been hurting me. Or more tender and vulnerable still, you have been hurting me. In the coming days, we are going to debate and vote on bylaws and statements and resolutions that are coming before us because our siblings have said, somebody's been hurting me. You have been hurting me. Friends, 
let us proceed tenderly. We have been hurting one another, and it has gone on far too long. And from our safety team, Indian Chris. Good morning. Before we arrived, I prayed for us. I found myself lingering on the verse of the 27th Psalm that can be heard on the subway among strangers and in conversations with grandmothers. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? A bold and perhaps aspirational assertion. We are not asking you to be fearless or unafraid. We are not asking our safety team volunteers to be fearless and unafraid, but we are asking everyone to be visionary Constructing an environment that is reflective of our paradise on earth, our home, until we are reunited with that which is beyond all human understanding. A world in which safety is transformative and collectively determined, as opposed to punitive and determined by broken systems that pathologize many while protecting few. I am not here to argue and debate your experiences, but to listen. And in turn, I ask you offer your neighbor a listening pair of ears and a compassionate heart. Good morning. So a few of the things that the safety team has been engaged with. A few nights ago, we learned that youth and the youth caucus were being harassed by security guards here at the convention center. We spoke with, the chain, with people with the GA planning to be able to talk with the security guards about the youth and the youth being here at the convention center at night and this was a place of socializing and to not harass the young people. We're doing the best we can to try to prevent that from happening and we continue to ask that if you hear of, if you're, if you're part of the Youth Caucus or the Young Adult Caucus and you experience harassment, to please let us know, or anyone else who experiences harassment from either security or police. We also sadly heard that a black Unitarian Universalist two nights ago was on their way during evening programming to come into the convention center. Many white UUs were outside the convention center as well, walking around. I'm sure some of them had name badges on. I'm sure some of them did not. This black Unitarian Universalist was on their way into the convention center. They were stopped by a police officer who asked, why are you in this area? The UU responded, I'm here part of the General Assembly. The officer responded, well, where is your name badge? Again, assuming that this is not true, that this is not uh, legitimate. The Unitarian Universalist continued to explain why they were here, needing to prove their ability to be present in public space, that they needed to prove that they could be connected to this General Assembly. And so they were eventually able to come into the convention center. But another thing of note is that no other UU, no other white, no white UU or other UU came over to see what was going on. And so if we see police interacting, often harassing people around the convention center, it's useful to just go over and ask, you know, officer, what's going on here? To at least go and try to engage. And so this is a reminder of why we are part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Yesterday, the Westboro Baptist Church showed up, six of them, over 70 to 100 of us were out there singing, protesting. It was powerful, it was beautiful, it was on fire. We also had many of you continuing to go to the GA programming so that they did not take the energy away from us building our movement. Kansas Poor People's Campaign leaders, Reverend Rose Schwab and Anna Maldonado led the rally with the singing and with the agitational inspiration of why we are here. Two local activists, not a part of General Assembly, but a part of our justice community, 
Two local activists pulled up in front of Westboro Baptist, stopped their car. The one driving came out, confronted the Westboro Baptist, got right in their face, explaining why their hate was not wanted in her city. The police very quickly and very aggressively arrested that local activist and attempted to arrest the other activists. India and others from the safety team were able to help de-escalate with the police not arresting the second person, trying to get the police to chill out. They were very aggressive, they were very confrontational, trying to get the police to chill out and not escalate the situation as the boomerang effect that India has been talking about was so evident of the way the police quickly escalated everyone in the area. That local activist, the UU World, was following up, confirmed that she has in fact been released two misdemeanor charges, disturbing the peace and impeding the flow of traffic. But she was released from jail. Reverend Krista Taves had the idea of a minister's delegation to try to negotiate with the police to try to get her released. Many ministers with Reverend Rose at the lead tried to get the police to just release this local activist. That was unsuccessful, but, we were, but eventually she was released from jail. But, I, but to close, a young person with a trans flag I think summarize what happened with Westboro Baptist. They looked over at Westboro Baptist and said, I almost feel sorry for them. They're trying so hard to hate us, and we are so fabulous and so powerful, they can't do anything to us. As is required for every General Assembly, in large gatherings of this size, we have a convention center, we have convention center security and police officers on site. To clarify, we are making a request of the General Assembly to shift our reliance and responsibility onto community, to turn towards each other when we are feeling unsafe and provide support for one another. We are asking you to let the safety team know when these instances occur. We cannot ignore power and powerful systems within our society. However, we can begin to shift power towards everyday people. We can continue building capacity to sustain our movements, and each one of us choose the life-generative practices that makes the miracle of waking up every day possible. In the words of freedom fighter Asada Shakur that are offered during many demonstrations rallies and protests. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you, Greg. So the sound we heard was the Amber Alert. I did not get it. Some of you did. So maybe at some point you can tell us what it is, then we can all be on the lookout. So it is now time for the President's Report. Please, everyone, give it up for the President of the UA, Susan Frederick Gray, and the Executive Vice President, woo woo, Carrie McDonald. It's been a pleasure for all of us to work with them this year. Oh, it is good to be here today, and it is good to be together. I want to shout out uh, a congregation and some people in the audience that are important to me. My mom and dad are here. They raised me, you know, I'm lifelong UU. There you are. <laughs> Later, I'll introduce you to Alandria's parents, because they're here too. And, and I understand that Elliot Chapel, I'm a Missourian, a Missouri native, grew up on the other side of the state in St. Louis at Elliot Chapel, and that there's like 57 people from Elliot Chapel. So thank you all for supporting the UUA and being here. What a time this is, a time when we are all being called into a deeper practice of our theology, 
living into the call at the heart of Unitarian Universalism for beloved community, a community that practices a radically inclusive and deeply compassionate, anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural, multi-generational faith within and acts powerfully in partnership and solidarity for justice and liberation for all. This call to our faith comes to us in the midst of a time marked by tumult and tremendous pain. Last year, in the months leading up to General Assembly, our association went through a major disruption. UUA President Peter Morales and several other senior leaders resigned, and we grieved for the death of our moderator, Jim Key. Our interim co-presidents, the Reverend Sophia Bentoncourt, the Reverend Bill Sinkford, and Dr. Leon Spencer provided unbelievable pastoral presence, stable leadership. Stabilizing leadership and a call for deeper transformative action, a call to renewal and change for the UUA and for all of our congregations and communities. GA 2017 was a time of truth telling about the past and the present. We wrestled with and named the heartbreak, the mistrust, the broken promises and unfulfilled dreams of our faith. And we were also confronted with an increasingly dangerous and dehumanizing political situation in our country and our world. Last year was not the beginning of these challenges. And wrestling with them has been painful and difficult, but it has also been profoundly faithful. In a culture such as ours that loves debate, but runs from conflict that can transform us and runs from discomfort, being faced with our own distance from the beloved community that we espouse is an invitation to real and transformative change. And yes, we have many examples of both succeeding and falling short of this work. My friends, there is pain in change and growth. There is pain in childbirth. There is pain in the resetting of a bone. There is pain that comes in building new muscles. But the most painful wounds are those that go unattended and unnamed. And so we are called to do the attending that these times necessitate, because the stakes are too high if we don't. Right now, right now, the liberating achievements that generations have won are being rolled back. The extrajudicial killing of black lives by police continues. The assault on the rights of gay, lesbian, bisexual people, on transgender and queer people, on folks living with disabilities. The repeated attempts to ban Muslims, the growing anti-Semitism, the rolling back of reproductive and health care access, the separation and jailing of children at the border affront our values. And all of this is fueled by a rising nationalist movement that is proud to claim the symbols and ideology of Nazis and the Confederacy. I witnessed this all too clearly in Charlottesville, Virginia last August, a story that I will tell more about on Sunday morning. We are living in a time in this country when mass shootings are becoming normal and our global climate is in chaos. Last summer was a devastating season of storms and fires. It moved us to establish a general disaster relief fund. 
knowing that this will continue. And I am grateful to all of you who donated to that fund and helped us collectively as a covenanted faith show up and support one another in these times of crisis and trauma. As this external heartbreak continues, our internal heartbreak also continues. Unitarian Universalists have been examining the ways that a culture of white supremacy continues to inhibit the fullness and the practice of our theology and each of our liberation and the ability of people of color to thrive in this faith. This year, we have seen how the burden of this institutional change work does not fall equally on all shoulders. This year, we've seen a record number of religious professionals of color face challenges and conflicts in their ministries. Each context is different, but the overall number is troubling and heartbreaking. It is also important to acknowledge the number of religious professionals of color in our movement and how that has been growing. And there are wonderful stories of success. This year's attendance at Finding Our Way Home, the UUA's annual gathering of religious professionals of color for collegial and professional support and education was the largest in its history. to Unitarian Universalists of color, and Unitarian Universalists with identities that have been marginalized, dismissed, or ignored in this faith. I want to say first and foremost that I am sorry for the hurt that continues to be done. The microaggressions and practices that dim diminish and discount your leadership, your presence, your dignity, your humanity are real. And the work of changing this reality is for every single one of our leaders and congregations to take up. And as white leaders and members in this faith, we have to sh shoulder and lift this work. It is not OK for it to rest unequally and unfairly on leaders of color in our movement. <laughs> to Unitarian Universalists of color, to Unitarian Universalists who hold identities that have been marginalized, diminished, and dismissed in this faith, this is your faith. You know it's deep, liberating theology. And you see who and what Unitarian Universalism can be if we live into the fullness of our calling. To each of you, I'm committed to being a partner and an ally so that you see yourself recognized at the center of this faith and it is felt with a clarity that no one can ever question. What does it take to really live into bold and transformative change? First of all, it requires a clarity of direction and a commitment to the values that must always guide the work. And it also requires diverse leadership and the centering of the margins and a commitment and knowledge about the work of change. It requires skill building and muscle building for this work. At the UUA, we are committed to institutional change work that we are calling the work of inclusion, equity, and change. 
And we are approaching this work on three levels, at the associational level at the UUA, at the institutional level across the broader UU landscape, and at the congregational level. So first, organizationally and internally. Here are some of the first moves that we're making to change the UUA's internal workplace culture and spirit. This fall, we completed a thorough review of hiring practices to implement the diversity hiring goals set by the interim co-presidents last spring. These changes, this is one of my favorite parts, my friends, these changes include putting our theological values in our personnel manual, in our job postings, so people know who we are and the vision we seek to live into. It also means changing requirements for job openings to allow for a broader range of experience to be considered and creating diverse hiring teams and training hiring managers. We've also embraced collaborative leadership models, including the co-directors for the Ministry and Faith Development Department, Sarah Lammert and Jessica York, and co-directors the, in the Southern Regional Lead position, Connie Goodbread and Natalie Briscoe. We've put diversity of leadership as a foremost priority, including professional diversity, promoting religious educators and lay leaders into top-level positions at the association. I invited to Queen of Boston to serve as special advisor to the president for inclusion, equity, and change, recognizing that in order to live into a multicultural religious community, the commitment needs to live not as a department of the UUA, but at its center and drive all the work that we do. And I want to say that one of the lessons that has emerged in this work is a reminder that we can do big things at the UUA. The Justice GA created in response to the boycott in Arizona is one example. The move from 25 Beacon to 24 Farnsworth is another. This was a major change, and it was guided by the values of collaboration, accessibility, innovation, and environmental sustainability. Our values guided the move. And I am grateful to the leadership of President Peter Morales for guiding and seeing the innovation and the, uh, the, the leadership that was needed to move us and help open up new ways of being in our faith. And here's one more piece. So just like our work of dismantling a culture of white supremacy within our faith, the question was not whether we were going to move, but how. Right? That's the same right now. It's not whether we are going to move, but how. At the larger institutional level, reaching beyond the staff and the organization of the UUA, we are supporting broader institutional change. First and foremost is the support for the vital work of the Commission on Institutional Change, which is examining the breadth and the depth of, culture, of the culture and practices of Unitarian Universalism and our congregations, and how we continue to see a real difference in outcomes for members, leaders, and religious professionals based solely on identity. And that is not right. The supportive relationship between senior staff and the commission is essential to guiding the work of change at the UUA. To the members of the commission, Leslie Takahashi, Chair, Duro Farrar, Natalie Fenimore, Mary Byron, and Elias Ortega Aponte, and Caitlin Breedlove, I say thank you. Thank you for your leadership and support. And to the congregations that you serve and in which you lead, I say thank you to those congregations and leaders for supporting you in this work. 
because we recognize the way that whenever our leaders support the larger association, there is sometimes a sacrifice by the congregations in that. So thank you for your support of the broader mission and the institutional change at the UUA. Number two is the funding of the board's $5.3 million commitment to Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. This is another bold investment in institutional change and has been a key priority this year. Blue is one of the most innovative and exciting ministries in Unitarian Universalism. Committed to providing spiritual care for Black UUs, supporting and amplifying the leadership of Black UUs, and providing spiritual UU spiritual sustenance to grassroots justice movements, nurturing within and beyond. You'll hear more about Blue and have throughout this assembly, but I want to share that we have raised in gifts and pledges already $3.1 million towards this fund for Blue. So if you haven't done a promise in the practice collection at your congregation, I invite you to go back home and get it on the calendar and it will be matched. Your gifts will be matched. Let's get there to $5 million. Let's get there next year, right? Let's fund Blue and get that money there and help them do this innovative ministry. Support the innovative ministry that they are leading. And. Over the next few years, we need to be building and investing right alongside the commitment to blue, the resources for the UUA and congregational change work, as well as support for the ministries of drum and trust and equal access to make sure that we are funding institutional change at the broadest level. It's time to dream big and invest in this faith and its promise. All right, congregations, the most important part, yes? This year has been one of a lot of transition at the UUA. And we are diving deep into examining and shifting our culture, but the truth is, if this change doesn't happen in our congregations, our faith will not be transformed because it is in our congregations that people find Unitarian Universalism and are ministered by it or are not, right? So that's where the change has to grow. So here's how we're beginning to bring this work into congregations this year. But you know what? It's not just the work of the UUA. We want to be partners in it, but it really belongs to all of you. But here's how we're beginning. We've created a cross-staff team, including the Faith Development Office and the Outreach and Public Witness to curate helpful resources and skill building for congregations on dismantling a culture of white supremacy. I recommend this page to you, videos, articles, all kinds of things to help deepen your understanding and skill building in your congregation. The Office of Church Staff Finances has put together a resource on staffing for diversity in congregations. And we're also strengthening our commitment to the annual Finding Our Way Home Retreat, support for a trust gathering of transgender religious professionals, for Thrive Leadership School for young adults of color. In all these ways, we are trying to build this work. We're also doing an audit of the UUA's many scholarships, grants, and assistance funds for congregations and leaders, making sure that they have a lens of equity, inclusion, and change at the center of those grants. Next year, we have put funds, so this coming fiscal year, we have put funds to invest in training on cultural competency, race, gender, identity, and power dynamics for UUA staff, in particular UUA staff who work directly with congregations so that we are skilled partners, the skilled partners that you need 
to nurture the change efforts in your own congregations. And we're looking to invest more in ministerial startups, particularly for congregations who are calling or hiring religious professionals of color. Now these are just the next steps in the long haul work of nurturing cultural and institutional change. But the work is not just internal. One of the things I learned serving in the ministry in Phoenix was that the cultural change work in our congregation was about educating and building skills internally, but also partnering directly beyond our own congregation with communities directly impacted by oppression. That work of following, showing up in the streets, understanding the realities of the racial and systemic oppression in our country was critical to actually changing culture within. One of the most important ways that the UUA serves the mission of Unitarian Universalism is by amplifying a national voice, moral voice, for our values in the world. This year, we've invested in a strategic review of our public witness work and made the intentional decision to center our justice work in solidarity with grassroots organizing that is led by people of color, indigenous people, and folks directly impacted by impression and injustice. Interfaith work continues, but we are really prioritizing grassroots organizing. In collaboration, I want to share a few highlights as well. In collaboration with Equal Access, we responded to the call to change the ableist language of standing on the side of love and have renewed our justice initiative to be side with love. You can get your new t-shirts and stoles at the online. I bet there's some in the exhibit hall as well. The UUA and the Unitarian Universalist, the UUA and UUs across the country have been showing up and organizing with the Poor People's Campaign in unbelievable numbers, a national call for a moral revival. A campaign with a broad moral agenda that addresses poverty, access to health care and quality education, sovereignty rights, so sovereignty rights for indigenous communities, climate justice, LBGTQI rights, women's rights, and the fight against criminalization, deportations, and expanding militarism, bringing all of these issues together to create a moral revival. Last month, I was arrested along with 19 other UUs as well as other religious leaders on the first day of 40 days of action with more than 100 UUs across the country taking direct action with that campaign since that first Monday. It's incredible and it needs to just keep building this work. The examples of our justice work this year go on, but one final one. We see this centering in our justice work, centering with grassroots organizing in the growing response of Unitarian Universalists to the work of expanding sanctuary through the Love Resists campaign, combating criminalization of immigrants and communities of color. So Love Resists is our justice campaign that is specifically focused on fighting criminalization. And through Love Resists, we are working to end the money bail system, which is the highlight of the public witness this year, led by Black Lives of UU. <clears throat> we also offer education resources, coaching, and spiritual sustenance for those engaged in sanctuary policies, community support networks, and accompaniment programs. Currently, across the country, over 80 congregations are a part of the UU Sanctuary Movement. Nine congregations, this number changed as of this GA, nine congregations are currently providing physical sanctuary to individuals or families, and more are ready if asked, and more are accompanying immigrants through the immigration criminalization system, through the court system. And this spring, through the Side with Love campaign, when the U.S. president threatened a caravan of refugees coming to the U.S. border, many UUs opened their homes to sponsor refugees and to show that as hate tries to close our borders, we will open our hearts and our homes.
This means that right now, as we see children separated from their parents at the border, that we must be clear that the criminalization of immigrants, migrants, and refugees is the source and the system of the injustice. To be clear, the decisions over the last few days by the President's administration is not a win. It is not a win. Instead, it is clear that their intention is to erect tent cities, to detain families indefinitely, without access to legal counsel, without basic rights. Criminalization is what we must fight. And we must recognize that the U.S. has been separating families and taking children from their parents for a long time. Black families have been separated and are, continue to be separated by the police state and criminalization in this country. Indigenous families separated, Asian families separated and housed in camps. This has been happening throughout our history. This is not new, but it is also urgent. And we have to be careful when we talk about what the growing authoritarianism in our country. I hear people use the language of Nazis and fascism, and some of those terms are accurate, but what I want to be clear on is that what's happening in this country is deeply rooted in the history of this country. It's a re-emergence or a growing emboldening of the Confederacy. And the genocide and the enslavement of black people. Okay, so it's not foreign. But it's urgent right now. And it's moving quickly, as we all experience. So there are two mobilizations that are being organized right now, and we've been working with partners on these efforts, and I want to share them. And the UUA and the UUSC, through Love Resists, is amplifying these call-outs. So if you have your calendar in your pocket, in your phone, you can take it out. I want you to write these dates down. July 2nd in San Diego, we have been asked to show up in mass numbers with longtime immigrant rights partners, including Puente, Arizona, who we worked with on Justice GA, longtime partners, to show up on July 2nd in San Diego to call for the end of this criminalization of immigrants and migrants. And June 30th, June 30th in D.C., a National Day of Action. So there's going to be a mass mobilization in D.C., but there will also be events happening across the country on June 30th through Families Belong Together. Again, calling for a change to these, this zero-tolerance criminalization of migrants and refugees. July 2nd, San Diego. June 30th, D.C. the foundation of our justice work is the deep call to keep our hearts open, open in the midst of policies and politics that tell our hearts to be afraid and to cut off from one another, to keep our hearts open in the context of a daily onslaught of trauma, anxiety, and heartbreak, to keep our hearts open to one another. From love resists to side with love, we are showing up again and again for humanity and for our own humanity with the spirit of bold and courageous love. All of this internal and external work and the work to come in the years ahead is the work of a tremendously faithful group of people, a tremendously group 
tremendously faithful group of people. That includes you all in your congregations showing up faithfully for your values. It also includes an incredible team of people that I get to work with at the UUA, the amazing staff of your UUA. I want to take a moment to introduce the person that I have the great privilege to work most closely with at the UUA, the newly appointed Executive Vice President of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Mr. Kerry McDonald. Carrie's experience and background in public policy, education, government, and economics bring so much to the UUA. His skills in strategic thinking, organizational detail management, and his obvious love for Unitarian, Universalists, Unitarian Universalism, and his commitment to the way our faith is being called into transformative work make him an excellent EVP. And I am so fortunate, we are all so fortunate to have Carrie McDonald as EVP. Thank you. It is such an honor to be working at the UUA at this moment, especially side by side with the UUA's first elected woman president, Susan. Every day, I am grateful to have such a talented, committed, and courageous group of colleagues. If you see them in the hall with that staff ribbon on their name tag, feel free to stop them and say thank you. And I'd like to ask the UUA staff who are here in the hall to rise and body your spirit so that you can show your appreciation for their service to our thank. Thank you all, colleagues. We love you. And on behalf of Carrie and myself, we are grateful for the leadership of the UUA Board of Trustees, and especially the co-moderators who we work very closely with, Barb Grieve and Alandria Williams. What a pleasure it is to serve with both of you. And we are grateful for the work that we are doing as a whole to invite Unitarian Universalists into a larger conversation about our mission and purpose and calling and how we can be organized not only for impact but to live more fully into our values. It is a pleasure to work with each and every one of you. Thank you for your service and leadership to the UUA. Mm. As UUA president, my priorities for this first year have been to strengthen the relationships across our faith and to put mission at the heart of all we do. I've been blessed, blessed to show up and witness and worship with UUs and UU congregations all across this country. It's one of the things I love the most about my job is being in your congregations and seeing you all across the country. And guess what I'm finding as I travel? Good news comes when we live into our mission. In the, last, in the past year, congregational giving to the UUA has increased, and adult membership has grown for the first time in years. We are not social clubs, right? We're deeply rooted faith community answering the call to love. This is the power of mission and being mission focused and how it unleashes vitality in our communities. The messages of decline in religion are a testament to the ways that religious communities have succumbed 
to cultural and consumerist values and lost sight of a greater mission to heal the world, to side with the poor, the imprisoned, the oppressed, and offer all people a way of living liberated from systems that seek to define and confine us and our relationships. And I want to be clear that as a white person, I am in this work for my own liberation from those systems, right? We are all in this for our liberation, our collective liberation, so that we can all be free. The key to growth and health for our congregations is a recommitment not to be conformed to the dehumanization that infects our society, but to transform it in ourselves and to organize to liberate our society from its destructive exploitation of the life of life and the planet. In this moment, we are being called to imagine and experiment new ways of living our faith. As Sophia Betancourt said last night, to give those dreams wings. We can be a faith where those who have been marginalized see themselves centered. We have to be a faith where those who have been marginalized thrive. We have to be a faith that encourages the fullness unfolding of every person. And indeed, our values, our theology call us to this future. We are called to manifest our Unitarian Universalism as deep spiritual compassion and meaningful resistance. In these times, it must, we must develop a practice of protecting each other. You're hearing that again and again from the safety committee, got safety team, protecting each other and become a source of the practice of the world that we know is possible and that is longing to be born. This is a time to invest in your faith and your values like never before. This is a time to keep our hearts, our spirits, our commitment, our generosity open while the forces of fear and scarcity and dehumanization swirl around us. This is a time to invest in your faith, your congregations, your communities like never before. This is a time for each of us to answer, how are we gonna answer the call and the challenge of this moment? How are you, how are you gonna answer this call? The way ahead, my friends, my faithful, faithful companions, will not be smooth. The challenges ahead internally and externally are serious. They're life and death. And pain is always a part of growth. We will make mistakes and fall short. Forgiveness and grace will be needed. I know for me, some of answering the call will be on the streets, on the streets in neighborhoods in Florida and Ohio, canvassing for ballot initiatives that expand voting rights, that give voting rights back to people who have been criminalized, expanding democracy. For you, I hope you might show up in Florida and Ohio on some of these ballot initiatives that are critical for expanding voting rights and democracy. It may also be for showing up for candidates that you are so excited for. I hope for some of you it will be in direct action, resisting criminalization and militarism like on July 2nd and on June 30th. It may also be in creating rituals of resilience and sustenance that we all need to survive. Creating music that inspires us to joy, tending the spiritual community that is a sanctuary of both rest and resistance and resilience. Wherever you are, wherever you are, whatever your passion, your gift, the feeling of calling in your, home, in your own heart, say yes to that call. We all need to show up, not all in the same ways, but in ways that we haven't shown up before, with more risk, with more courage, with more 
care for one another. And I want to thank each and every one of you for how you are already doing this. Because I know that you're already doing this. And my heart breaks with your hearts in this time. And my heart is emboldened by your hearts and your leadership and your faith and how I see you showing up. These times are challenging, but we have been readying for them. I think about how when we can't know what's ahead, when we live in times of deep uncertainty and promises of winds and a brighter day right around the corner are hard to imagine and cannot be promised. For me, the question is, well, what am I going to do? I can't control the outcomes, but I can control how I live and where I show up and where I give my money and where I invest my heart and my time. And that is my choice and my power and is your choice and your power. <laughs> Focusing on the outcomes may bring us despair. Focusing on what we can do right now and the call from our neighbor and caring for one another, that's what gives us hope. Hope is being able to respond out of our values despite the systems that we live in and work for them in small ways and big ways every day. So I thank you, Unitarian Universalists across this land. Thank you for your commitment, your risks, and your generosity to your faith, to your local congregation, and to the UUA, and to how you live your values every day. As your president, it is my unbelievable honor and great pleasure to serve with you in this time. Thank you. If that doesn't get you going, I don't know what will. Uh, how many of you ever bought a book from Beacon Press? Wonderful. Beacon Press has long been the UU's voice to the wider world, and I'm happy to see that the press continues to do good work and to flourish. And here to tell you about it this morning is Beacon uh, Press's director, Helen Atwine. Helen, come up and talk to us. Well, thank you, and um, talk about a hard act to follow. That was the most inspiring, the most electric speech. I'm so proud to be the director of Beacon Press, working with this dynamic and wonderful administration. So um, it's a real privilege, as always, to report to you on the work of Beacon Press. And like the entire association, we have also been very focused on confronting the systemic issue of white supremacy and working to dismantle it. First, I want to affirm that books do matter. We're reaching a lot of people. These are just two examples from our comprehensive social impact report, which you can read on our website. We're jumping a little ahead here, but um, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, better? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Sometimes our books work in ways we couldn't foresee. 
like these two congressional interventions on gun violence and prison reform, both issues, of course, which disproportionately impact communities of color. Beacon first published this book 25 years ago, two years before I came to work as director. After all that time, we've managed to pull back all the rights that were licensed, so we now have the hardcover, paperback, ebook, and the audiobook, all with new material. This book may be older than some of you listening to me, but I promise it will speak to you as powerfully as it did to readers of all races and generations 25 years ago. And Cornell West continues to be on the front lines in the fight for racial justice. We just saw his photo with our president on the screen just a few minutes ago. Today, we are seeking out new activists with new ideas and perspectives who have a lot to teach us about what true racial equity looks like and how we might achieve those goals. In fact, it was Cornell West who called out to us the work of Charlene Carruthers. We're learning more about what it takes to build community, to honor people, and to find common ground. In Crystal Fleming's memorable title, we need to learn how to be less stupid about race. We're examining closely what steps we need to take, all of us, to have more inclusive and equitable society in our churches, in our workplaces, and even in our friendship circles. Many of you have seen, we can go on to Robin D'Angelo in action and know the power of her ideas. For the first time, and for us, she put those ideas into an accessible, inexpensive book. We couldn't bring her to Kansas City, but we do have the book at the In Spirit Bookshop in the exhibit hall, and we will try very hard to bring Robin back for workshops at the next GA. It's a really terrific book. We're very, very proud of it. And we couldn't have done it without a big assist from UUA staff. One of Beacon's most celebrated strengths is in, pulling, in putting a historic lens on current issues and reframing the master narrative. These books look closely at the legacy of civil rights movements and at what we can learn from the outrages of our past, the terrible injustices we visited on African Americans, as in medical experimentation on slaves in the 1840s, or the army hanging at Leavenworth all eight of the black soldiers on death row while all nine of the white soldiers were freed. And this in the 1960s. Our authors work to surface that history, to lift up those stories so we can learn from them. And so we can learn how history teaches us to resist in the political arena and even on our playing fields. Many of you know our Revisioning American History series on the next slide. Um, many of you know our Revisioning American History series through Rox, there it is, <laughs> Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's revolutionary book, An Indigenous People's History of the US. That book has now sold over 100,000 copies. That's something to applaud. These are the latest books in that series. The Paul Ortiz was just published, and the Dinah Berry Kelly Gross is coming out later this year, again, upending the master narrative. And while we focus on these urgent issues of racial equity, we're also publishing books that address the full range of social justice issues that we're all concerned about. Part of the struggle for racial equity is the fight for economic justice, workers' rights, good jobs, and good pay, 
And of course, it all starts with our public schools and making sure all children are afforded a quality education, not the Betsy DeVos vision of privatized, religiously affiliated, and even cyber charter schools that have white supremacy built into their very fabric. All the issues you see displayed here are part of building a just society. So I give you these words from the Reverend Barber. We need you to stand up again, to speak up again, to come together again until justice is realized, love is actualized, hate is demoralized, war is neutralized, racism, classism, and religious bigotry is marginalized, and the beloved community is actualized. We have two powerful authors about to speak at workshops. I hope you can join us at one of them. And I want to say that we couldn't do this work without your support and the support of the UUA and the Veatch program at Shelter Rock. And for the past two decades, we've been lucky enough to have Tom Halleck helping us guide our work daily. Tom, stand up. In July, he leaves us, but not entirely. He will be on our board of advisors. We can't thank you enough. And thank you all for listening and for supporting our work. We welcome UU leaders from around the world to General Assembly each year and extend our gratitude towards them. Many have traveled a long distance to share their experience, their wisdom, and their faithful solidarity during challenging times. To introduce them to you, please welcome Reverend Eric Cherry, the director of the UUA International Office. Thank you very much. And while we say that these leaders are guests, we do so as a reminder to American Unitarian Universalists that hospitality is our privilege and responsibility when people journey here. In fact, our guests are leaders of our global faith, your leaders. And as we welcome them, please note the commitment that they bring to our faith every day. And we hope you will be inspired to explore how your local UU community can find itself in the global UU story and engage supportively. Dr. Rika Lamar is a physician and social activist focusing her energies on issues relating to drug abuse, HIV AIDS, and the health and welfare of women and children. She is the co-founder and chief functionary of the Manba Foundation, an organization working in the field of drug abuse. She is also a leader of the Unitarian Union of Northeast India's women's wing, Singh Thai. Dr. Rika is focusing on a project to adapt and teach the Our Whole Lives curriculum in Northeast India as we speak. <laughs> Professor Rupaya Lamar is a church elder of the Unitarian Church of Douai in Northeast India, which is the pioneer church established in 1887 by founder Hajam Kisser Singh. He was born to a second-generation Unitarian mother and an indigenous religion, Nyamtre mother, practicing, oh, practicing father. Professionally, he has taught political science in government colleges for 30 years, recently retiring. Rupaya is the vice chairperson of the church and the chairman of its hymnal committee. 
and he is one of the five Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist theologians from around the world who are leading a year-long theological dialogue inspired by the 450th anniversary of the Edict of Torda. Dr. Dipti Das is a retired principal of the Government College in Dubai. She has done her MA and PhD in philosophy and her doctrino, doctoral thesis is Gandhi's Doctrine of Truth and Nonviolence, a Critical Study. This has been published recently as a book. She has an interest in the philosophy of religion and she belongs to a, faith, a school of faith of Hinduism in Assam. Through her marriage, she came into contact with the Unitarian faith, and she is an active participant in church activities and has also participated in Unitarian Universalist conferences and pilgrimages abroad. She lives with her husband, Rupaya, and daughter, Kankor. <laughs> Reverend Norbert Jolt Rotz is the minister of the Central Unitarian Church in Kolesvar, Transylvania. He is a graduate of the Hungarian Unitarian Church's John Sigismund College and the Protestant Theological Institute in Kolesvar. Before being called to serve the church in Kolesvar, he worked for the Hungarian Unitarian Youth Association, Odfie. He is married to Maria Ratz. Norby, as he prefers to be called, is also one of the five UU theologians from around the world who are leading the year-long theological dialogue inspired by the 450th anniversary of the Edict of Torda. <laughs> Reverend Lydia Emesheb Badur was born and raised in Cluj-Napoca, Kolesvar, Romania. She finished her high school years at the Janusz Zsigmund Unitarian High School and after that, she studied at the Protestant Theological Institute and became a Unitarian minister. At the end of her studies, she returned to the Janusz Zsigmund Unitarian High School and started work as a religious teacher and school chaplain. For the last eight years, most of her work has been related to children, youth, and a variety of educational issues. She believes in the importance of education and loves working with students. This year, Emesha has been the Star King School for the Ministry Balash Scholar. <laughs> Paul Nianzigye is a member of the Allen Avenue UU Congregation in Portland, Maine but he is originally from Bujumbura, Burundi, and served as a leader of the Unitarian Church there before coming to the United States. In Bujumbura, he worked as a high school teacher and administrator and supervised community-based grants on behalf of the Unitarian Church there. He continues to be involved with Burundian Unitarians, especially those who are refugees in Rwanda, due to dangers in Burundi, and we introduce him to you today at his request that we all remain in faithful solidarity with Burundian Unitarians in whatever country they may find themselves living today. Reverend David Clements is excited to be serving as the interim minister to the Cape Town, South Africa Unitarian Congregation. Cape Town is a beautiful place to be serving and the Unitarian Church is celebrating all this year their 150th anniversary. <laughs> Ministry is a second career for Dave. He was an organizational and fundraising consultant and he is finding those skills very useful in his ministry there. Home base for Dave is Cleveland, Ohio, where his partner Jerry resides. Dave is a Meadville Lombard alum and in his spare time enjoys painting and quiet walks along the beach. If you have never been to South Africa, come, Dave says, and discover the Unitarian Church and the people, you will have a life-changing experience.
I would invite all of you to visit the Global UU Story online and find doorways into it for yourself and your congregations, including ways to join the UU celebration of the 450th anniversary of the Edict of Torta this year and the upcoming Reimagining Interfaith Cooperation event that will take place in Washington, D.C. from July 29th through August 1st. Welcome into the Global UU Story, and please welcome Global UU leaders from around the world at General Assembly this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now want to introduce Cristina Riviera for our Distinguished Service Award. She's getting the love. If Unitarian Universalism out of faith had a chaplain, it is Danielle Asuntag de Bona. Your service to, universe, to Unitarian Universalism spans more than 30 years. And during that time, you have touched thousands of Unitarian Universalist lives in ways that are seen and unseen. If anyone in this hall has been the beneficiary of Daniel's ministry, please wave your hand, stand, or make yourself known. I see some folks. <laughs> oh my. Typically, this presentation of honors begins with a recitation of the honoree's educational degrees and qualifications. The ways in which our dominant culture recognizes those accomplishments forms a basis of the value we place on a person and their place within society. Unitarian Universalism exists within our dominant culture and our reverence of those accomplishments is no different. But for people of color, these accomplishments are not simply indicators of class status. Your successes, first at Smith College for your bachelor's and then Ursuline Saline College for your master's, were and are an act of resistance. You dare to imagine institutions that would have no choice but to recognize your tenacity and brilliance. You dare to bring your whole self to institutions built upon the exploitation and oppression of our ancestors. You dare to insist that your place at the table be recognized and valued. And it is that daring spirit that your Unitarian Universalist ministry embodies. In the earliest years before what we now know as diverse, revolutionary, multicultural Unitarian Universalist minist multicultural ministries, you were instrumental in recognizing that if we were going to confront racism within Unitarian Universalism, we needed a shared language to even discuss it. You were instrumental in creating the workaround, defining what anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multicultural looks like in Unitarian Universalism. Because at the time, it wasn't something that you used really understood, and many bristled at even naming in their faith. If this looks easy because many now so easily utilize the language of anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism, we need only look at our current difficulty embracing the words around white supremacy culture. Amen. Mm -hmm. You are a steady and sometimes fiery presence in drawing you use into conversations around AROMC and white supremacy, and then holding them in that space as they experience hurt, shame, anger, reflection, laughter, and resolution to begin again. Several UUs of color were consulted in writing of this commendation. Clyde Grubbs, who shares a similar native identity to yours, shared a meaning of the name of your people, the, and I'm not gonna say this right, help me. Wampanoag. Wampanoag. See, that's how you do it if you don't know, you ask. He said, the creator gives assignments to the people, and an assignment of theirs is to be greeters of the dawn, of the morning light. This is fitting for a people who live on the shores of what is now known as Massachusetts. 
And it is the bringing of this light to Unitarian Universalism's challenges in which you have shown. One time was at the 2001 General Assembly in Cleveland, Ohio. Folks gather here may remember that Cleveland has this little problem with his baseball team. It's a racist name. Well, you were not about to let our faithful gathering take place in a city so clear, with so clear an attack upon our Native communities. You helped coordinate the public witness event that included our siblings of faith at the, UU, the United Church of Christ and placed hundreds of UUs in protest directly outside a Cleveland baseball game. You led them through a torrential downpour. Yeah, some of you remember it in order to give witness of our gathered commitment to justice. And now public witness events are part of GA schedules with dedicated resources giving to living out our faith in the world. In your current retired professional life, you are a palliative care chaplain at hospitals in our community. You also serve in ministry positions at congregations throughout New England and uh, as a stint on their anti-racism program association for the UUA. You currently serve as the board of trustee, on the board of trustees as, uh, for the Church of the Larger Fellowship and are a past president of DRUM. The nominating of the, of the committee of the UUA was blessed by your constant vigilance about diversifying the membership of our committees, including your deliberate and expansive allyship for our LGBTQ community. And congregations have been blessed with you as a facilitator for beyond categorical thinking workshops to help them move beyond the narrow views of what ministry looks like. You have mentored dozens and dozens of religious professionals in their ministerial formation, and no recitation of your accomplishments would be complete without the fabulous triumphs of your Pumi dogs at <laughs> national dog show events. Follow Danielle on Facebook. But it is as a chaplain that your ministry has so beautifully flourished. Time and time again, you have offered yourself to Unitarian Universalism as the minister to come to in times of trouble, when grief is present and threatening to overwhelm, when anger is so palatable you can see it shimmering in the air, and when joy and laughter are to be found. These are the times we find you, Danielle, at the center. You've been a chaplain for General Assembly, for DRUM, for Finding Our Way Home, and now you serve as a chaplain to our own UUA Board of Trustees. Many people wonder why Unitarian Universalists of color need our own chaplain, so let's share what your chaplain ministry has been literally life-saving for so many POC. It is because you know the struggle of people of color in your essence. You too have been brought to the brink of despair in Unitarian Universalism, where any reasonable person would consider throwing in the towel, where the thought of waking up to face one more day of micro and macro aggressions is just too much where the abuse and injury is just too much to bear on behalf of and in service to our faith. It is your capacity to viscerally know these depths of despair and yet help the person you are ministering to transform that despair into resilience and to a core of strength that brings our ancestors to the center and then witnesses our collective joy at Faith Reborn. That is why we honor you here today. This type of service isn't often recognized, the one-on-one -on -one quiet, and sometimes not so quiet, <laughs> service from the edges. So I'll ask again, after having said all of these things that you have contributed, I'll ask the faithful here gathered today now that you have heard all the ways in which you have served our faith. Who here has been touched 
by the ministry of Reverend Daniel DeBona. That's right. Today we celebrate and consecrate your ministry, recipient of our highest honor, the Distinguished Service Award. As Danielle's getting the love, I'll mention that Danielle's uh, guest here today is Robert Diaz, 2009 Drum Mel Hoover Award winner. We are so honored to have you here with us. Well, first I want to say, Robert, where are you? Okay, thank you. <laughs> My heart, sister. Never thought I'd be here. My father, an Italian immigrant, was Daniel DeBona. Donato in Italy, but changed at Ellis Island. My mother, a Wampanoag Indian, was Helen Catherine Bates Tabana. As you honor me today, you also honor them. I am deeply, deeply grateful and humbled to receive this award. I know many of those whose names are on the Distinguished Service List. And I know that there are many people in this room who are just as or more deserving than I am. And so I am grateful. As I reflected on the Distinguished Service Award, it occurred to me that it is about service. Service something we can all do. And sometimes there's absolutely nothing distinguished about that. <laughs> Ask around. <laughs> Your service is no different than my service. And it's the way that we serve each other and the way that we share this saving faith. This is truly a saving I can't see what I wrote because of the tears in my eyes. Now let me tell you a story. Many years ago, as a biracial American Indian, I quickly became aware of the racism that permeates Unitarian Universalism. I became one of those angry, loud women of color that you have all come to know and fear. <laughs> My loud voice and the voice of so many UU people of color was ignored, was silenced, was put aside. But I, we, could not be silenced. Soon I, along with so many others, were put aside. We were banished. We were shunned. Please hear that this was not happening in my community of color who held me and loved me all these long years. 
and I love you all. I see you sitting here, my family. <laughs> I love you too. We were put aside. We were noisy. We were loud. We were so angry. And our leaders and our church leaders did not want to hear that. And so we were put aside. And then, a miracle. Many of us were somehow rehabilitated. And I was among those who was rehabilitated, welcomed back into the circle of love and care of Unitarian Universalism. And I never left. I was just set aside. Maybe it was because I was older, tired, and my voice was weaker. And maybe my resolve was also weaker, but make no mistake, even my weak resolve is stronger than many of your resolves. And so you have the opportunity to grow a strong resolve. As you know, I stuck it out. And being rehabilitated, I worked my hardest to rehabilitate this faith that I love a long, hard, heartbreaking task. Today we are at another crossroads. We are encountering another group of angry, loud, young Unitarian Universalists of color. Young as I was so many years ago, and maybe louder. They should be angry. We should be angry. Yeah. They should be loud. Yeah. We should continue to be loud. Because, my beloveds, although we have come a very long way, the road is long and hard, and it is uphill in both directions. When I was angry and loud, my community was being decimated by the racism within Unitarian Universalism. And if I named all who were lost, or pushed out, or left of their own accord, I would use all of my four minutes listing them. I beg you, do not, do not make that mistake again. You will not have another chance, and this is your second chance to make an incredible difference, not a little difference, but to transform our faith. Listen to those young, angry, loud people of color. Listen and hear with your hearts wide open, because you are given another chance, and you may never, never get it again. Listen, and more importantly, follow. Open your eyes and your heart and close your mouths and follow so that we can be part of and build together the beloved community. I am Again, deeply, deeply grateful and moved for this honor. I will, for the remaining years, humbly continue to serve you. Thank you very, very much. I just have to say, Robert Diaz, thank you for everything. Yes. I love you. All righty. Can we please welcome Jessica York, Faith Development Director and Interim Director of Ministries and Faith Development, 
for the presentation of the Angus H. McLean Award for Excellence in Religious Education. Good morning. Have you ever heard it said that ours is a questioning faith? You know, often when I'm giving my elevator speech, that answer to Unitarian Universalism, I never heard of that religion. What do you believe? Uh, I might say that if you ask 10 UUs what they believe about God or what happens after you die, you'll probably get 10 different answers. And one of the reasons for that is because as Unitarian Universalists, we ask different questions. Dealing with life's big questions is the basis of our faith development programs. We feel it's not just our privilege, but it's also our responsibility to ask the question and to wrestle with the answers individually and communally. Now, sometimes you might hear some folks say, the important thing is not so much the answer, but to ask the question. Yes, and yet sometimes the answers are really vitally important. I'm an our whole lives facilitator and trainer. <laughs> and in that program, we use a question box. How many people here have ever seen or used or created a question box? Yes. So the question box is uh, great. And we tell participants that they can use the question box to ask any question, and at the next gathering, it will be answered. The first time the congregation I was serving offered the junior high level of our whole lives, the facilitators brought me the first question from the question box, and it was, how do fish have sex? And they said to me, we don't have to answer this, do we? And I said, yes, you do. <laughs> and maybe you want to start doing some research. <laughs> some questions that come through the question box may seem silly, but one of the values we lift up is that we respect the search for knowledge, because knowledge can sometimes lead to power. Another reason we answer every question that comes through the question box is because we believe that no question is too dangerous to be asked and no truth too hard to be told. The religious educator being recognized here today is nothing if not an asker of questions. <laughs> Last spring, they asked a question whose answer forced a hard truth, that our faith was not living up to its ideals. That religious professionals of color were not only not playing on a level playing field, but that many were not even admitted to the ballpark. That a culture of white supremacy inherited from the white dominant culture was ingrained deep in Unitarian Universalism norms of behavior and thought. Now, since that time, this question has sprouted many other questions. It's also open space for some possible answers. How many of you participated in a white supremacy teach-in in the last year? A nice majority there. Thank you. The first one was created by three religious educators, Christina Rivera, Kenny Wiley, and this morning's honoree, Asha Hauser. Now, Aisha could have just stopped with answering the question, asking the question, instead of coming up with some answers. But instead, Aisha rolled up their sleeves and plunged their hands in deep, and along with Christina and Kenny, did the work that religious educators always do. The work of sensing the margins of living our faith in this uneven, distorted and unjust world. And they pull those margins out further yet. Or from the inside, they push those edges, stretching them, not to a breaking point, 
because our faith is strong, but to a place of greater wholeness. Religious educators do this work from a deep and powerful love, a love for what we could be together. Bringing people together to create something more than what exists right now is ministry that Aisha has been doing for a long time. After working as a social worker, they found their calling and service as Director of Religious Education at First Unitarian Universalist Church of Exus County, Orange, New Jersey, and Fourth Universalist Society, New York, New York, and as Director of Lifelong Learning at East Shore Unitarian Church, Bellevue, Washington. Asia was a colleague of mine in the Lifespan Faith Development Office for three years, writing and developing curricula and programs to bring people together in congregational religious education programs. They have chaired the Loretta Integrity Team, a committee of the Liberal Religious Educators Association that work to try to keep Loretta true to his anti-oppressive, anti-racist, multicultural principles. As a religious professional and as a volunteer, Asia has demonstrated and promoted different models of shared leadership and service to UU institutions ranging from the UUA Nominating Committee to the Religious Education Credentialing Committee and by co-authoring along with Reverend Natalie Fenimore a chapter in the book Centering, Navigating Race, Authenticity, and Power in Ministry. Asia created a bystander training to empower people to intercede in bullying situations. As Asia received more and more requests for the training, instead of marketing it for sale to UUs, they created a webinar showing others how they could hold their own bystander training, and it's still being used today. Speaking engagements and requests for trainings from secular organizations are increasing and yet Asia always finds time to collaborate with others towards stretching the margins of our faith, as witnessed by their work over the past several months with the Faith Development Office and a team creating the White Supremacy Accountability Assessment Tool for Religious Education Programs, a program that we're rolling out at this GA. Now here is another hard truth. Asking the hard questions can make you a target for other people's fear. Asia has been attacked on social media, has lost friends, has been labeled as hysterical and a troublemaker. No one ever said our ministry would be easy but one of the qualifications for this award is someone who has brought dignity to the profession of religious education. <laughs> I believe that Asia has not only brought dignity, I believe she has redefined <laughs> Asia leads Unitarian Universalism to labor towards creating that heaven on earth that we all dream of. Asia makes me so proud to be a Unitarian Universalist religious educator. <laughs> My people, I give you the recipient of the 47th Annual Angus H. McLean Award, Asia Kadar Hauser.
Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, thank you to so many people that I love that are here today. Thank you. I love you too. Um, I first want to quote my friend, Reverend Natalie Fenimore, who said, I am in love with the Unitarian Universalism that does not exist yet. And then I'm going to quote my friend and colleague, Kenny Wiley. He wrote in a blog that post that went viral, there are so many things to fight and fight for in the world. We mostly do a great job on climate justice and immigration. Our LGBTQ work has saved and changed lives. Black lives, too, are worth fighting for. When the next Ferguson happens, and sadly it will, we can and must do more. We have to show up, be willing to follow others, and be willing to change ourselves. The next call to action for racial justice has arrived. My people, will we answer? This was written years before the white supremacy teaching. The UU white supremacy teaching movement was unprecedented in its scope, and it was just the beginning of a crucial conversation. This conversation has angered some and empowered others. It is for the first time an honest conversation. What is at stake is the heart and soul of Unitarian Universalism. We are a people of faith, a faith that demands of us reflection, determination, and yes, a commitment to justice. Centering the voices of the marginalized will be part of becoming whole as a faith and as a people. I am grateful for this award. I thank the Unitarian Universalist Association, and I share this honor with Kenny Wiley and Cristina Rivera, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, and all the religious educators who collaborated together to help move this faith we love forward. Thank you. Wow, are you feeling the love, people? This is fantastic. Oh, makes my heart happy. Uh, so quick announcement uh, that's coming to you from this safety team. We heard a little bit this morning about what is happening around identifying ourselves as GA attendees. Safety team would very much like folks to be wearing their badges both in the, the Jen Sesh Hall, ex, uh, Exhibit Hall, basically anytime you are in the convention center premises and as you are just getting into the convention center premises. That's a little bit different from years past where you really needed to kind of show your badge when you came into Jen Sesh and show your badge when you went into the Exhibit Hall and you could just kind of wing it for the rest of the time. That's not the case in the circumstances that we're in today. Uh, so please help out by doing that. I will note that whatever badge we wear, whatever clothes we wear, whatever identification we wear, does not put people of color out of danger, right? So this is not to say that somehow by doing those things, we will be out of danger. Right? So it is not on us to keep ourselves safe. We need your help doing that. All right. There being no further business to come before us and in accordance with the schedule, kind of, set forth in your program book, I declare that this general session of the GA should stand in recess until 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon, and the things we did not do we'll do at the very beginning of the next session. Thank you.